real honor, and uh, I can't tell you how much is appreciated. And Garrett's introduction reminded me, I'm using up my precious time, which is already 10 minutes <laughs> used, um, that uh, the Institute for Venture Science is actually coming into being, what he mentioned earlier. And there will be a website uh, that uh, will be published in about two or three weeks. And this is going to be a major institute, and it's designed, designed to, uh, to fund promising ideas that challenge conventional thinking. So please look out for it. I think you people will be quite interested. Okay, so I want to talk about water. And um, since I, I couldn't find water around here, I have a prop. <laughs> please pretend that this is water, okay, <laughs> as my prop. So mo most of you probably think, or some of you probably think that, that uh, everything that to be known about water must already be known because you know, water is the most common substance on, on the face of the earth, and, and it's around, and, and it's everywhere. And I want to start by demonstrating to you that your assumption that everything is known about water is not correct, okay? So here are three, three challenges for you, and tell me if you can explain these, okay? We start with the cloud that you can uh, always see, and the issue is this. Um, you know, the water is rising uh, from everywhere, and so how, how is it possible that there's only one cloud? How come there's no cloud here? Does all the water get sucked into this one? And how come we don't understand this? Uh, we see it every day. Here's another case. Uh, we have droplets of water hitting water. And of course, everybody knows they coalesce instantly. But you see that they don't coalesce instantly. Uh, it depends on the situation. And how do we explain this? Another case, which is well known to one or two of the uh, people in the audience, is Elmar Fuchs's uh, water, water bridge. And uh, so it's very simple. You put, uh, fill the beakers with water, put two electrodes in, put a high voltage between them, and uh, when you turn on the high voltage, you get a bridge. This is water. And if you separate one of the beakers from the other beaker, the bridge sustains itself. And it sustains itself for effectively indefinitely for distances up to about four centimeters. This is water. How come, how come we don't understand what's going on here? Uh, so I mean, that, that's uh, the point is, is that there are a lot of observations which, which escape our understanding. So we really don't know all there is to know about water. We started with water with this book, which was published in 2001. And the book describe the role of water in biology. When people learn biology, they learn that water is practically meaningless. They learn that water is the background carrier of the most important molecules of life, but as a reactant or something central to biology, forget it. It's not interesting. You can even almost have trouble finding the word water in the index of some books. Well, the evidence is not in favor of that, and the book was designed to show the central, the central uh, that water is absolutely central to all that goes on in biology. And one of the main uh, concepts in the book, which was taken from the extensive work of one Gilbert Ling, who's now 95 years old, and the idea is that inside the cell, the cell is a very dense matrix of proteins, and next to each protein and other macromolecular macro surface, the water molecules are not just like water in, in the glass. They're, they're, they're actually ordered in some way, so the water is represented here by a dipole, and so you can see the dipoles are, are kind of ordered, and eventually they get disordered with some distance. And we were curious, despite the fact that this, the evidence points to the fact that this is the way the water is inside cells, your cells, uh, the water is, is ordered. We wanted to find out uh, more about this, uh, this kind of water. And one of the chief characteristics of this is that because this water is just like a crystal, uh, the molecules are lined up, crystals tend to exclude solutes. And so one of the very well-established features of this is that solutes are excluded. So, so we came with that, that presumption, and we came upon an experimental way of, of studying this water, and the results amazed us. So that, that's a, uh, in a chamber, whoops, my pointer is... Uh, I seem to have lost it. <laughs> anyway, oh, here we go. You have a gel that you put in the water, and we notice that 
and here's water. Actually, this is water plus some particles, and we use microspheres, little one micrometer spheres that we put in the water. We noticed that there could be a, a zone where these are excluded, so we thought, well, perhaps this might have something to do with the, the region of ordered water. But there was more to it. We found that as soon as we put the microspheres and water in, the microspheres were excluded. They were pushed out of this growing zone, and, and we had this seemingly gigantic zone, uh, 50, 60 micrometers, which, which would be huge numbers of water molecules that were pushing this out. And, and, and these microspheres remained here. They would never go back in, into this region. They would show Brownian motion of all sorts, but would not re return to this. So because the particles were excluded, we call this the exclusion zone, or easy, uh, easy to remember. So, uh, we, we, we stuck w with this. So we tried another, another sample instead of the gel that you see here, which was a polyvinyl alcohol. This was the first record that we got. We used a, a sheet of naphion. Naphion, you'll see a lot of naphion because it turns out to be really convenient. It's a polymer that's a bit like Teflon, but it has sulfonate groups. It's charged. It comes in sheets, so you can cut a sheet out into, for example, into something of this shape, plunk it down in the chamber, add the water and microspheres, and when you do that, as soon as you add what happens, whoops, as soon as you add them, what happens is this. And this exclusion zone can grow up to half a millimeter. You can see it with your naked eye. You don't, you don't need a, a microscope. Well, look, this is taken through the, the microscope. Anyway, this, this seemed to be to us to be a, a, a astounding observation because we thought nobody had seen this before. It turns out there was a paper published in 1970 in the Journal of Physiology that demonstrated exactly this. And by now, a lot of people have tried this and have confirmed that there is an exclusion zone. So the question is, um, what is it all about? Uh, is the exclusion phenomenon general or just those couple of slides I showed? Does it really arise from the ordering of water? Uh, can water ordering explain those first three slides that I showed you? And in order to create order, you need energy. So where does the energy come from? It's not obvious. And might these findings apply broadly over nature? So for the first question about generality, um, we've, to summarize, <laughs> We've looked at many surfaces, many gels, at least a dozen different gels, various polymers, uh, uh, biological surfaces, and monolayers. And as long as they're hydrophilic, water-loving, we've seen this exclusion zone. Now, what's excluded from it? Uh, well, we've tried particles and then molecules down to 100 or, or so molecular weight, and they're all excluded. So, uh, I'll give you one example in, in, in the next slide. We actually, you know, in order to see what's excluded, you have to see what there is. You have to see the, the molecules, and so you'd think, well, the best thing to use is a dye, right, because you can see it. So we used the pH-sensitive dye. Some of you know, remember litmus paper? You stick in, it changes color. So the dyes are soluble, and uh, you can get the dyes, and they're mixtures of molecules about molecular weight 100 or so, typically, and you put, put them in, and, and you can see what happens. And, um, and well, I'm not sure if it's dark enough. Yeah, I think you can see it. Uh, so, so we have a piece of naphion at the bottom of the chamber. It gives you an exclusion zone. And uh, it's just water, dye, and naphion. So here's the dye, and you see all these lovely colors. But there's no dye here. There's a clear zone, and uh, so the dye is excluded. And these are molecular weight approximately 100 or so. Okay. More interesting is the color distribution, not only because of its attractiveness, but because of what it signifies. So for the, this particular pH-sensitive dye, the orange color means uh, pH 3 or less, which means a huge number of protons. So there's a proton gradient that runs from here to here. We'll come back to that. It, it's important. So in terms of generality, um, well, many hydrophilic surfaces generate exclusion zones, and many solutes are excluded. Question two, is this zone really physically different from ordinary water? I'm, I'm going to pretty much list the evidence without going through it, except for one of them. 
because it's all published and, and I'll take the whole hour if we, if we do that. And there's a lot I want to tell you. Um, first of all, the easy molecules are more constrained than bulk water molecules. They're more stable than, than ordinary uh, water. And the surprise for us was that this exclusion zone has negative charge. I'll, I'll show you the experiments because they're important in, in a moment. Um, uh, it absorbs light at a, in the UV light, 270 nanometers, and the ordinary water doesn't do that. It's more viscous than bulk water. The molecules in the EZ are aligned with one another. And the molecular structure appears to be different from ordinary water. And the optical properties are different. Actually, this is mostly by two Russian scientists, both from Moscow. They don't know each other. They did different experiments, but the result was the same, even quantitatively the same, that, that not only is, is the EZ birefringent or ordered, but its refractive index is 11% higher than that of water, which means it's denser, probably, uh, than, that's the simplest interpretation, than water. So, so those are, uh, there are actually one or two more. I just didn't bother uh, listing them, but I want to talk about the negative charge because that will color almost everything that I'm going to be talking about. And how do you measure that? Well, the experiment, sorry, it looks a little complicated, but it's really not. Inside means the inside of a gel, and outside is the outside of the gel where we put water. So we start with a polyacrylic acid gel right here. And we want to measure the electrical potential at the interfacial region here. And so how do we do that? We take two electrodes. We stick the reference electrode out here somewhere. And we have a probe electrode, which tapers down to uh, one micrometer or less used in biology for many years, invented by the same Gilbert Ling. So if you're at this point, which is several hundred micrometers from, from the interface, the potential difference between here and here is zero. And that's comforting because you don't expect any potential difference. As you get closer, you begin to pick up a negative electrical potential. And this region extends for about roughly the size of the exclusion zone of this polyacrylic acid gel, which is, it was shown here. So it looks like the exclusion zone is negative. So next, we rip out the gel, and we put a piece of naphion on here and do the same experiment. And you can see the result. And, um, and for naphion, remember I told you that the exclusion zone was on the order of half a millimeter, 400, 500, sometimes 600 micrometers. Again, it looks as though the exclusion zone is negatively charged. That doesn't make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? It doesn't make sense because you take a gel and you put it there and you pour some water. The water's neutral. So how is it possible that you get these really <laughs> extensive negatively charged zones? Well, if you think about it, the only reasonable possibility is that somehow the water molecules are splitting into negative and positive parts. And somehow, the negative ones are here, and the positive ones are, uh, well, probably out here somewhere. Um, but is there any evidence that they're out here? Well, you've seen the evidence. I turned it 90 degrees. Here's a piece of naphion, and uh, here's the exclusion zone. I showed you in the previous slide this region was negative. And remember, this one is positive, and, and it's got lots of protons. So, so we thought, let's just check and see if we're not deluding ourselves into thinking something is real when it's not. So we put one electrode here one electrode here and connected them with a resistor. And we expect to see current flow between, between the positive and the negative. And indeed, here's the current flow. This is, um, uh, it starts high at first. And then as a function of time, uh, it goes down and it reaches some kind of plateau, which extends for quite a while. It's not, the plateau value is not zero. It's a substantial uh, amount. So you do get current flow, which confirms that really there is charge separation between the exclusion zone and the region of water beyond the exclusion zone. So we have a charged battery in water. So I showed you uh, that the EZ has negative charge, and a Russian group has confirmed that. If you look and try to understand what the structure of this zone is, I showed you a stack of dipoles. Um, it, it sort of as a generality, the molecules are aligned. They're stable. They're constrained. 
this is a, the easiest or simplest statement of structure is that it's some kind of liquid crystal. We'll, we'll get more to that. So the summary so far is we have some kind of a liquid crystalline region next to hydrophilic surfaces. Most of surfaces are hydrophilic. It has negative charge. It excludes solutes profoundly. It may be non-dipolar. There are hints of that, and I'll get back to that in a moment. We think of the structure as the stack of dipoles, but it's not. Um, and it may extend very far from the nucleating surface. So how far is very far? The textbook, Physical Chemistry, will tell you that there may be two or three ordered molecular layers. If we're right, we have uh, one or two million molecular layers, uh, or two or three, not, not a handful. Um, it was suggested 100 years ago by a famous physical chemist, a colloid chemist, that water actually has four phases, not three, because it was really impossible to explain uh, many of the features of water. So I'm not sure if this constitutes a phase, but it satisfies the requirements of phases. It's bounded, it's uh, responsive to temperature and, and pressure, uh, and the structure is completely different, uh, uh, apparently, from, from ordinary water. The physical chemical characteristics I showed you the list show that. So it turns out that, that 60 years ago or 70 years ago, a lot of people were interested in this sort of thing. This is a review article from down around here from Stanford um, uh, by Henniker. It's a review article uh, and it, the depth of the surface zone of a liquid. Surface zone is the same as what I've been talking about, uh, the zone, the interfacial zone. And in the review article, they cite more than 100 papers that show before 1949 <laughs> that show that many liquids, including water, of course, change their structure radically n near interfaces, and, and that, that change extends out up to hundreds of micrometers. So this is just what we found. So there's nothing new in what we found. It was known 60, 70 years ago, and even before. Uh, so uh, where we are is, um, I, I, I've shown you, and now, now the question is, is it really, is this structure, which I've presented as dipoles, and my previous book said dipoles, and a lot of people think dipoles because water is a dipolar molecule, but is it non-dipolar? Why would we even think that? Well, it's actually very simple because um, the main point is, is that this region has negative charge. You can stack neutral dipoles from here to the moon, and you won't get negative charge. So something is wrong <laughs> with that. And also, this I mentioned the light absorption in the ultraviolet. Usually that corresponds to ring-like structures, not dipoles. Now, if you try to figure out what the structure of the zone might be, one way of approaching it, the way we approach it, is to figure out, to start with some precedent, a structure, a water structure that we know exists, and think that, well, maybe some modification of that structure could be the structure we're looking for. It's better than just pulling a structure from a hat. So, the precedent that we know about is ice. Uh, we, we know ice structure, the crystalline structure very well. And so you can see the structure on the left. These are oxygens here. And the hydrogens would be in between the two oxygens. Uh, I'll show you that on the next slide. It's omitted for clarity. So you see that it's a hexagonal sheet structure, and, and the hexagons are in register with one another. And it's a very nice uh, crystalline structure. If you look at it from a slightly different angle that's shown here, then you lose the, your sense of this hexagonality, but you do see these blue dots. So what are the blue dots? Blue dots are protons that exist between uh, uh, negative oxygen, so positive in between two negatives, and that's what makes ice hard, glued together. So we had the idea, what happens? We want a negative structure, not a neutral stru structure. So you know, the first obvious thing is, well, suppose we pull away these blue dots. You know, then we've, from neutral, we've taken positive, therefore we get negative. And we thought, we thought you know, this, this might be the answer because it gives us negative charge since the glue is removed. We're not solid anymore, which is ice. It's something that might be different. We thought we had the answer until someone tapped us on the shoulder and said, you know, it's wrong. Uh, why is it wrong? Well, it's wrong because 
if you remove the positive ones, you have two negatives sitting right next to each other. They repel, and the structure will fly apart. So minor problem, it's not stable, <laughs> can't exist. So after, after um, some period of depression, <laughs> uh, uh, um, an, an idea arose that, that seemed, seemed to be okay. So you t here we've put back the, the uh, hydrogen, so you have oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, and so on. And here's the, the one plane from behind and the plane closest to us. And the idea was simply to shift this one by half of the oxygen, oxygen distance to a new position. And then if something nice happens, because you still have the negativity, but now the neg negative oxygen lies juxtaposed next to the positive hydrogen. So there's a glue, a, a weak glue, an electrostatic attraction between the two. And you see that in many places in, in the lattice. So you have a weak, weak attraction of these planes. So they're not permanently glued. You can shear one past the other if you put enough shear force. And it satisfies the negativity uh, requirement. So it's stable. So the idea is something like this. You have a hydrophilic material sitting next to water. I don't know if you can see the water. Whoops. I can't even see the slide. Uh, okay. I don't, can you see it? Huh? Oh, oh, okay. Anyway. And, and these layers build one by one. And, and remember, they're offset from one another, shifted uh, slightly. And then the next one grows, and then the next one grows, and, and they keep growing layer by layer. If you look at the structure of a single plane, remember it has this hexagonal uh, structure. And if you think it's H2O, um, it's not, uh, because if you count the number, uh, remember H2O is neutral, and this is negatively charged, so it shouldn't be H2O. If you count the number of oxygens and hydrogens per unit cell, it's H3O2. So it's different, um, not exactly water. It's sort of like water. We've, in order to do this, we've um, we, um, Im implemented a right shift, but we could have done a left shift and get the same result because it's symmetrical or 60 degrees or 120 degrees, it doesn't matter. The, and why is that important? It's important because you can actually get a helical structure. So, so here's layer zero. The next one we've shifted zero degrees, 60 degrees, 120 degrees, and so on, and we get a, a nice helix. So, so why is that cool? Well, the helix is important because in biology, many proteins, nucleic acids, and such have helical structures and fibrous proteins. And it's well known that next to these structures is some kind of ordered water. So this ordered water suffices for explaining next to some other uh, molecule here how you can get ordered water. So the advantages of this non-dipolar EZ is number one, precedent. It's not so different from ice, although it's different. It has negative charge, which the evidence demands. The ring-like structures absorb at 270, could absorb, could explain the 270 nanometer absorption, and it's able to accommodate helical structures. So you ask the question, okay, you, you presented some logical arguments, but has anybody ever seen this kind of helical uh, structure? The answer is yes, many people have seen it, but the techniques have mostly been techniques that can actually look only at two or three molecular layers, with one exception. And this is, this is the exception. Now, this is from a, a group from Harvard, which means it must be right. <laughs> uh, and and uh, I've heard that Stanford has now overtaken Harvard as the place. Uh, to, okay, <laughs> so local uh, loyalty. Uh, <laughs> okay, and so this is an ancient protein, uh, ATP synthase, a subunit of that. And the role of this subunit appears to be that in, when it's not when, when the humidity is very low and the water would tend to evaporate, this subunit forms these uh, volumetric structures with water inside. It protects the water from evaporation, you see. Uh, and sometimes it forms these spheres. Sometimes it forms uh, hexagonal or other geometric structures. But anyway, having the ability to see these in the electron microscope and do electron diffraction, the result is shown here. And so this is the structure of the volume of water that's inside. And you'll notice first that the dots are, are very uh, sharp, which means they're ordered. Um, and the second is that there's a hexagonal um, arrangement of these. So the conclusion of these authors was that this consists of ordered hexagonal sheets of water inside. So 
there is at least some evidence that we might be on the right track. So the answer to the second question, is the EZ physically distinct? Lots of evidence shows that it's different from water. And I think the best evidence so far, which could be wrong, um, is that it's a layered honeycomb structure. Can crystalline water explain those first three slides and a few more? Well, so what, what kind of behavior do we expect from a, a crystal? Well, you know, crystals stick together, like a salt crystal or a sugar crystal. Uh, it can be hard. And, and if, you, um, if, you think, if you think about um, various substances, the first one I always like to is a gelatin dessert, as a jello. Now, so jello is mostly water when you, when you make the jello. And um, so the question is, well, gee, if it's 95% water, how come the water doesn't dribble out like in a shower? You hold it and, you know. <laughs> so some people would say it's osmotic forces. And, uh, but I've held gels from in Japan that peel just like jello, but they're not 95% water. They're 99.95% water. It's essentially water with a few strands of polymer holding it all together. So the idea that osmotic forces could hold all that water is hard to, to, uh, to imagine. So this is what a gel, um, a computer model of a gel, looks like. And the yellow stuff is, is the protein or polymer, the matrix of the gel. And you see these great big holes and spaces, pores in, in, inside. And, um, and so again, the question is, well, gee, <laughs> with all this liquid, it should, it should leak out. However. These surfaces are hydrophilic. And we know that next to hydrophilic surfaces, the water lines up in, in sheets and forms this EZ. And so they're filled with EZ water, and the EZ layers stick to one another and stick to the surface. And so that's the reason that the water doesn't dribble out. It's stuck inside because of these forces. And another, another point is, you know, you, you, you feel the gel. It feels gel-like. It has this really weird consistency. And Probably the first time you saw it as, as a kid, you remember, this is kind of weird, you know? And, and if you read the chemistry books, they'll tell you that this has to do with the viscoelastic properties of the polymers that are inside. However, I'd like to suggest to you it might have to do with the water that's inside, especially, especially when the gel is 99.95% water. It's kind of hard to attribute those properties to the few strands of polymer that happen to be inside. And you expect gel-like properties of this kind of structure. Another point, if you put either this old Hungarian coin or, um, or a pin on the sur or a paper clip on the surface, despite its high density, it doesn't sink if you do it carefully. If you put it beneath the surface, it sinks, but not some of you have done this. And so we were curious about this, and we found, we studied the water on the surface, and we found that the kind of water I was, I've been talking about grows at the air-water interface. An experiment is very simple. Uh, it's two pieces of glass like this and sealed around the edges to make a chamber. You fill the chamber with water and microspheres. So, so here you have the air, and then the meniscus is next. And the water and microspheres scatter a lot of light. And the clear zone, we found it didn't start that way, but 15, 20 minutes or so, this zone opens up and becomes clear. So it basically, and it stays that way. And then roughly a day or so later, all the microspheres sediment to the bottom. And nobody knows exactly why that happens. But uh, at any rate, it looks like there's an exclusion zone right here, this clear zone. We measured the electrical potential, especially near the top. We found a negative, big negative electrical potential. And the next slide will show you that it is not water here. This acts like a, a gel, a cohesive gel or a thick rubber band that runs right across the surface. And the experiment is shown here. So this, you've seen this in the past slide. Here's the clear zone. And here's a probe that's going to touch the surface, perturb it. Then I'm going to move it around back and forth and mechanically perturbed, and you'll see that the thickness of this, the height, doesn't change at all, or noticeably at any rate. And um, so here, it's touching the surface, mechanical force pulling up, and then going side to side, and the height, thickness uh, of that dark region doesn't, so it sticks together in, in, uh, in some way. So, so in, in terms of, of what holds this up, you know, the textbook says, Water has high surface tension, but if you think of the reason why water has high surface tension, according to the textbooks, 
is that the water molecules like to stick to one another transiently, but at the top, they can't stick to the air. You see, so these hydrogen bonds will flip down. So you get a few extra hydrogen bonds in only the top molecular layer. And the question is, well, is that enough to explain this? And I, you know, it might be, but I, I don't think so. Anyway, we found that there are many layers. We're talking about millions of molecular layers that are different from ordinary water, the stiff EZ lying on the top. And that's what creates the um, so-called anomalously high surface tension of, of water. And that explains um, this guy, who's a, this is a, or it might explain it, this is a, a lizard, and it's from Central America and spends part of its time on branches like this, but it spends the rest of its time walking on water. So it's uh, called the Jesus Christ lizard because it, it walks, <laughs> walks on water. And uh, so the question is, can one molecular layer explain this? Or do you need something thick that I've shown? And I, I think it's something thick. And the same thing applies to the pendant droplet, which I showed in one of the early slides. So the droplet's going to fall on the water. But remember, this water interfaces with the air, and there's a thick, easy layer on the top. This, too, is interfacing with the air, so it's also got uh, an easy layer around it. So when this meets this, it's not that you have uh, water meeting water. You've got easy meeting easy. And so it, if that's the case, it's no surprise that it doesn't coalesce instantly. You have to break through the easy. And you can see this is a, it's a kind of like a salsa. That um, This is, by the way, we published this, but it's, it was published 100 years ago. There's nothing new. We just had a better camera. <laughs> um, crystals, another point is crystals can be very stiff, as you know, if you have diamonds and rubies and whatever. Uh, and uh, it could be, so if you, if you think of this structure as, as being, you know, H2O, it's impossible to understand how H2O can, can do this, but if you have a crystalline version of such, then you can understand that under certain circumstances it could do that. And finally, in this series, um, the crystalline zone, uh, he here's a, an anomaly. You know, you have minus and plus. Usually when you have minus and plus, the two want to recombine uh, with, with one another. Now, these don't recombine because you have negative uh, here and a, a positive here, and we stick an electrode between here and here, and the potential difference is maintained essentially indefinitely. So they don't recombine. So what is it that keeps these? Actually, they're not protons. They're, if you add proton next to water, gives you H3O plus, gives you hydronium ions. So how come these hydronium ions don't rush in and annihilate all the negative charges? Well, they don't do that because, we think, because the, this matrix here, the hexagons are so small to let only very few things through, and they're all shifted relative to one another, so the effective hole is so small that even though these positive char charges want desperately to get in here, they're kept out. And so the battery charges remain separated. So the answer to the question three is yes. Liquid crystalline water explains many anomalies. It explains why the water battery charges remain separated. Okay. So now here's the $64 question. What charges this battery? You know, your cell phone battery, you, it, you need to p plug it in, and there's no receptacle here for this. And so, you know, where does the energy come from to build order and separate all these charges? It's not so obvious. It took us a while, I must admit, uh, to figure out the answer, which is very simple, light. Light, photons are, are doing this. And we found this in a really simple way. That is, uh, we, found, we took a, a piece of naphion, and also a, we had a gel, but in the first one, a piece of naphion. And uh, here's the exclusion zone and the microspheres. And one of the students came by with a portable lamp from the laboratory. And so we're doing the experiment, and he shines the lamp. On, and, and so this is an actual record of what we saw. This is not actual. <laughs> but, uh, and, and then when he re withdrew the lamp, this went back down to, a, over a, a time constant of uh, tens of minutes, went back to this. So, you know, we uh, didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, uh, you know, the energy, photon energy, might be responsible for building uh, this. We did spectroscopic measurements, uh, and, uh, well, I, I don't want too much time to talk about it, but we found the most powerful 
of wavelength, surprisingly, was infrared. So especially around three micrometers. Three micrometers infrared is what water likes to absorb the most. Apparently, this energy that the water absorbs is directly converted into the buildup of the EZ and the separation of, of the charge. So some of you know all about infrared, and others might one, wonder, well, where, where does infrared come from? So you know that if you turn on the electric range, it gets red, and infrared is coming from, from that. But actually, infrared is all over the place. You can't get rid of it. If I were to turn off the lights in this room and whip out my infrared camera and turn it on, you'd see a I'd see, we'd all see a beautiful image of, of the tables and you and the pencils and the chairs. Everything is radiating infrared. So it's free energy. In chemistry, you learned about free energy and concepts that were maybe a little bit complicated. This is literally free energy. It comes free, and this is what's building the EZ. The other wavelengths also, but this is the most powerful for building. So we thought, uh, okay, can we reduce the amount of radiant energy and see if that diminishes uh, the exclusion zone? Living in Seattle, uh, we knew that Starbucks was the answer. <laughs> you put iced coffee in here, and it stays cold because it's blocking the infrared from coming in. So instead of iced coffee, we put the chamber inside. And of course, it was not this. It was a doer from the physics department. To, uh, and, and we found that, so here's the control. You can see the exclusion zone. And 15 minutes in the doer, it's diminished. And then 15 minutes outside, it builds back up again, although not yet completely. So, so it's very simple. The idea is that you have a material and you have easy water. And this has been built by, by the environmental energy that is being absorbed. Uh, by the water, uh, and if you add more infrared or whatever, it builds up some more, and if you take it away, it comes back to its control. So the answer to question four about energy is that easy buildup is powered by photonic energy, uh, which orders the water, charges the water battery, so the situation is uh, kind of like, <laughs> like this. Now, if you think about what this might mean for the universe, or at least the Earth, so the sun we know that the sun hits the water and generates heat. Okay, you can go swimming. So what I've shown you is that there's another pathway. The sun, hit, or light, I should say, uh, hits the water, and uh, the energy fr from the photon energy imparts energy in the water for building order and separating charge. So whether this is most important or this is most important is not clear, or indeed whether there's no real arrow here, it goes only this way, and this is degraded as heat. That's another possibility. Now, if this water, so to speak, is, is absorbing energy from the environment, right? you might ask the question, can, can we harvest some of this energy that's in the water? Now, I, I bet that not one of you has ever seen water doing work, glass of water, right? <laughs> I, I, I presume that you haven't, because I. But actually, I'm going to show you that the water does work. Again, this is another undergraduate student who, uh, who came running into my, I, I, it's unforgettable, came running into my office to tell me. He said he took a tube that's made of napion, and you know it gives exclusion zones, so there would be one inside, just inside, and one just outside. He put it in water and with some microspheres, and he's looking at it for a different, different reason, and he told me, Whoops. <laughs> what did I do? Oh, postpone my upgrade. OK. He <laughs> <laughs> I keep doing that. That's why I'm oh, OK. So, um, so he told me that this was running through, and it's running through indefinitely. It just keeps going. And he didn't know, but I knew that in order for, for water to, to, to go through a tube, you need a pressure gradient because you know, it takes energy, it, it's doing work, requires energy, and he said it keeps going. We've actually had it going for a day and a half um, more, more recently. So the experiment is very simple. It looks like this. You take a tube uh, of naphion, uh, and you fill it with water, make sure there are no air, air bubbles inside uh, because they will interfere somewhat. Put it in the water with microspheres. Look in the microscope. We use green light in many of that, so a lot of the images appear green. And what you see looks like this. So here's the naphion exclusion zone, of course, and it just keeps going and going and going. We thought, okay, well, this is naphion. Is this something 
exclusively associated with nafion, or do other hydrophilic surfaces do the same? So we tried various gels. And here's a polyacrylic acid gel. And what we did is we formed the gel by having a wire inside. And you pull out the wire. And when you pull out the wire, you're left with a tunnel. So we take the gel with the tunnel and we put it in water plus microspheres. And what you get is an exclusion zone, of course, exclusion zone. And here are the microspheres. And the microspheres just keep flowing through. We've tried six different gels. We got a similar result. The speeds are a little different. And then finally, we tried, because we think all of this is driven somehow by light. So we added more light to see what would happen. And we just published a paper showing that if you add more light, you get up to five times increase of flow speed. So basically, we have a hollow tube in water. Work is done because you can't drive fluid through a tube without doing work. Energy is required. So this system must somehow get its energy. And where does it get its energy? Well, I've demonstrated to you that this is absorbing energy all the time. It's not at equilibrium with the environment, as the chemistry and physics book will tell you. It keeps absorbing energy. It's transducing that energy into mechanical and, and other kinds of energy. OK, so this seems rather radical, even to this group, maybe. <laughs> but think about your plant that, think about the plant that you have that's uh, sitting on the windowsill. So where does it get its energy? Well, you know where it gets its energy. The, um, the photons are converted in, into chemical energy, uh, and the chemical energy is converted into a metabolic energy, uh, bending, growth, et cetera. It, the energy is from here, and I'm suggesting the same here. And it's no surprise because this is built mainly of this. So, so I like to have the equation. You know, I know that the units don't match, but uh, <laughs> uh, you, I think you get the idea that this is full of energy. It's not at equilibrium with the environment. Last question. OK, now, why is this important? I think it's foundational for any or all science involving water and molecules and light. Uh, so we start with this slide, which summarizes all I've said. So if you're still sleeping, uh, you, you can just get it. Uh, and uh, so if you have a, a charged particle or molecule uh, sitting in water, here's the water. It's got this very large exclusion zone uh, around it, which has negative charge. And the corresponding positive charge is all around, around here. You see, this, and, and, and all of this is driven by light, OK? If you read the chemistry book, uh, you'll see none of this. And, and so since this should apply in all aqueous chemical reactions, if it's correct, then it might be necessary to reanalyze many of the chemical reactions that occur that are given in the textbook because they don't take into account any of this. If you have two of them, suppose you have two negatively charged entities, and suppose you drop them into my uh, glass of water here, right here, near each other so they can feel each other's charge. They're both negatively charged. So what do you expect happens to the distance between them? Anybody? Take a guess. They're both negatively charged. I see uh, uh, this way. Everybody agree? Yeah, OK. The answer is that they actually come toward each other. And this is not my crazy invention. This has been known for almost 100 years. And it was known by Irving Langmuir, the guy, a physical chemist for whom a journal is named. They, they come, come together. And uh, Feynman, in his lectures, talked about this. And he called it like likes like, uh, because these are like charges. And you know they like each other, so they come together. So uh, he said, like likes like because of an intermediate of unlikes. So where do the unlikes come from? That was not clear in Feynman's. And, uh, but now you can understand where these positive charges come from. When these negative ones get built up, you have all these positives. And in between these two, they're in highest concentration because you have contributions from this side and this side. And so they come together. This principle uh, of, of, um, of, of, of coming together is actually well known. It starts a 1,000 years ago in the tale of Genji, uh, the first novel, where um, you, you have warring parties. They don't look like this exactly, but um, they, and they will never come together no matter what, unless you put um, 
you know, in, in, in between. So like, likes, like because of an intermediate of unlike. And so they come together and, and they stop. Uh, we get stability when the attractive force bringing them together uh, by the positives is equal to the repulsive force here. And then if you have not only two, here's the principle, but have a lot of them, um, you have a structure like this. It's called a colloid crystal. And the particles stick together. They come together because of this like, likes, like principle. So this is a very easy principle for self-assembly. All you need, basically, is particles, water, and light. And, and therefore, you might think about the beginning of life where you may have had molecules and water around the planet and light, and it will automatically come together into a gel-like blob, inevitably. So, and if you've had yogurt this morning, probably um, the consistency of your yogurt is something explained by this, this kind of principle. And then we go back to the cloud and I raise the question, and so how come, how come you can get a structure like this? Well, if you think about what's inside the cloud, the cloud consists of these little droplets, so-called aerosol droplets of water. They're negatively charged, that's known, but there's a lot of positive charge in the atmosphere, and so these come together because the positive charge pulls those aerosol droplets together into a cloud. And if you were to have another one out here, this positive charge would pull it in. So you can see that you can get discrete structures. There is a force that pulls all these uh, together. And by the way, it's a net negative force, I, I think, of, of the negative charge of the cloud. And the Earth is negatively charged. And that's the reason the clouds are up there instead of showering us on the head because of that repulsive force. Does biology use radiant energy? Um, well, you know, we receive radiant energy all the time. Uh, and the question is, if you were Mother Nature, would you just discard it and re-radiate it? Or would you use it, maybe in the same way that plants and some bacteria use this energy in the fir first step of photosynthesis? So one way this might happen, if you think about it, is, is the vascular system. And the vascular system is right, right near the, the periphery. In fact, light penetrates pretty deeply uh, some, some wavelengths. If, you, if the room is darkened and I take a flashlight and I'm dark adapted, I can see the light coming through my, the palm of my hand. So, so you've got a lot of light and different wavelengths that you're absorbing all the time. I started my career studying the cardiovascular system and never <laughs> did it ever occur to me that light might be giving an assist until I met some Russians who told me that uh, there's a problem here. What's the problem? The problem is that the capillaries are in young, healthy people, three, four, five micrometers, and the red cells that have to pass through are six or seven micrometers. That's weird. It looks like nature made a mistake. I mean, there are engineers here. No engineer would ever design a pipe that's smaller than, the, the, imagine the sewer pipe, smaller than, uh, well, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's weird. So he said he calculated the resistance of this, uh, of these, of the capillaries, and the resistance of the capillaries was so, so high that it would require, he, he calculated, or they calculated, this is from Moscow University, uh, they calculated that the heart would need to develop a pressure one million times higher than it does in order to drive the flow through these capillaries. So therefore, you might need an assist somehow, and they had their own ideas, but I'm thinking, well, gee, you know, we're absorbing a lot of light, is it possible that light, since it drives flow through tubes, maybe it drives flow through, through capillaries? And uh, so I, uh, here's a, um, an image. This is muscle tissue. And here, here are the capillaries uh, that are flowing through. And, and you know the red blood cells are supposed to look like this. But you can see they have to get squinched down in order to get through. And, and so they, they do it. They go through. Whoops. They go through. You notice that there's no fluctuation with the heartbeat or anything like that. They just flow through. And this guy is having a lot of trouble getting through high resistance vessels. So, so the question is, um, you know, is it possible that radiant energy that we absorb is actually driving the flow not through the big vessels but through the narrow capillaries? Uh, might radiant energy, and a PhD student of mine is working on this question right now. And uh, I, there's just one piece of evidence I'll mention. Uh, that is, is weird. Uh, this is from an Israeli group. They're studying mice. 
and they're, they're using the optical coherence tomography method, which is you can measure uh, blood flow even in, in, in planes that are deep uh, uh, beneath this light scattering. You can get very clear images. And th so they're using this technique to measure blood flow and in the presence of various agents, a drug or whatever. And, and so they're doing this. At the end of the experiment, they sacrifice the mouse. And they do it by clamping the aorta. And within a minute or so, there's no heartbeat. The mouse is dead. However, the flow continues. They find the flow continues for one hour at least after the mouse dies. And they repeated this in 10 mice, and they got the same result. So the heart is not beating. The blood is flowing. Something is there is helping to propel the blood. And this device uses a lot of light, by the way. So I think it's possible that we capitalize on this energy. And um, also in, in your cells, you know, you have, uh, you have proteins and then you have this easy water surrounding these proteins. Of course, the cell is very crowded with this stuff. This is just a schematic. The cells, so the cells are full of easy water. And it's been known for years that structure, most of the water is so-called structured or ordered water. And I think we call it easy water. Uh, and, and, and so most of the cell is, is like that. They're full of easy water. And remember, the easy water is negatively charged. And so if you think about why every cell has negative charge, there's a theory that has to do with pumping and channeling of the membranes. I think that, uh, w without going into detail, that uh, at least some contribution comes from the water because easy water is negatively charged and the cell is mostly easy water. And, and, and so this is a, a, a different kind of explanation for the cell's negative potential. It's known that sick cells are less negative. For example, cancer cells, instead of minus 80 or 90 millivolts, minus 30 millivolts, similar with, with kidney cells. And so the idea is that some of these sick cells might have less easy water. And so what you want to do to restore health is to build up this easy water, to rehydrate, rehydrate and build up the water and the negative potential. And so that may be the reason why your experience is, you know, you go into a sauna um, or you go into sunlight. It's been like Seattle. It's cloudy and the sun comes out and you feel good. So why do you feel good? There could be many reasons why you feel good, but I think a possibility is that, perfect, is, is that you build EZs and uh, cell charge and that enhances function and health. And so I'm not suggesting that we photosynthesize like plants. But the first step in photosynthesis is the light comes in and next to a chromophore, it splits water. Well, that's exactly what I've been talking about. Next to a hydrophilic surface, the light and photon energy is splitting. So we may, we may do something similar to what plants do and what bacteria do, capitalizing on this very effective use of energy that we absorb to use that energy. I can't end without the obvious. Um, everybody wants to know. And uh, so the idea is like a photovoltaic cell getting, getting energy from sunlight and water without depleting the earth of its resources. So here's easy water and bulk water and you just put two electrodes in and you should be able to get, I showed you that you could get current out of this. So we've gone ahead slowly because of funding issues. And we've shown that you can actually do this in a practical way. So here are a number of these little cells with uh, multiple electrodes, and we can light an LED. So out of this, uh, it, this is just the past few weeks, we can get more than one milliwatt of energy, which is enough to power a sensor or something like this. And the second is, what about drinking water from contaminated water? Well, we have something. In fact, we have a patent for it. Um, so here's a Nafion tube. And flow goes this way. So the flow, the water coming in may contain all kinds of garbage. Uh, our garbage is microspheres, uh, but you could have bacteria. We showed that they're excluded, viruses, whatever, um, uh, chemicals. So it comes in, and you have an exclusion zone here, which doesn't have any of that junk. And all the junk is here. And so we collect the junk and get rid of it. And uh, then we, uh, this is the stuff that's clear of that junk. And you can see, and we've been able to obtain in a single pass, 200 to 1 separation. And we're now trying to scale it up because the throughput of this, the amount of water that we get from one tube, is enough, is trivial. It's, it's enough to satisfy the thirst of a flea. We have just recently 
been able to confirm that we can separate salt. This is the past month or so. And so it's possible that we can actually take salt water, we hope, and get drinking water out of this. No energy is required except the energy from the sun. So I conclude um, with uh, uh, the main, the few, the main points. So we've learned that water has three phases, ice, water, and vapor. And I've shown you the evidence that there's a fourth phase, or if you want to call it that, easy phase. And I put it in between these two because its structure, as I said, is very similar to ice. We have evidence. If you want to freeze water, go from here to here, you must pass through this phase. That is, you go from water to easy to ice. And if you melt the ice, we just have a paper published, it goes from ice to easy to water. This is a necessary intermediate between these two. Uh, and the implications of this, um, you know, the main point is that, is that water is always absorbing, it's a transducer, always absorbing energy from the environment. And I've shown you uh, it might have something to do with driving flow in, in, in capillaries and many other biological uh, um, uh, phenomena that I haven't had a time to, to, to talk about. The chemical reactions, um, you know, if, if we're right, then it's necessary to look again at all the chemical aqueous chemical reactions that occur and possibly reinterpret. The weather, uh, these clouds are anything that are charged. They're full of charge. And if you, the current people who model the weather, they consider only temperature and pressure and historical trends. The word charge hardly appears, even though <laughs> it's obvious that you know, we, we see lightning and such. It's obvious that charges are all over the place. In terms of health, uh, cer drinking certain kinds of water, I think water that contains a lot of easy water is good for your health. If you want to process food either by dehydration or, or freezing, you need to know about the water that's involved. And I've shown you that it's possible to filter using this easy principle, uh, maybe desalination, preliminary evidence, and getting electricity. And uh, as Garrett mentioned, um, the book that describes this uh, is, is been out for, for um, oh, close to a year now. And there's so much in it that is just much more than I've been able to tell you in this short time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for questions. York. Many points come to mind, but um, I think the two most important, if uh, ambient IR, if the normal thermal radiation of the environment is enough to produce an easy zone, a, uh, a water battery, um, even though it's intensified when you add more light, that uh, you, you've already violated the second law of thermodynamics. Congratulations, you're extracting <laughs> energy from a uniform heat bath. Also, I'm wondering what produces the symmetry breaking where a uniform tube produces flow in one direction and not the other. Oh, let me answer the second one first, uh, because the first one is, is more complicated. Uh, the, the first, we don't know. One day we move in this direction, uh, the, the flow goes in this direction, and the second day it goes in the other direction. So it's not predictable, which uh, at least so far we don't know. We presume it's some asymmetry because we take a tube and the tube is impossible to have everything be symmetrical in, in the tube. The tube, we cut it and there are, there are ends of the tube and ends are kind of irregular. The light is coming in. You may have more infrared or more other wavelengths coming from one side than the other. As far as thermodynamics uh, is, is concerned, you know, we, we don't, uh, first of all, the principles of thermodynamics are, some of them are treated in the book. And um, there are some issues with, with thermodynamics, with the basic principles that I will take up in the book, and too much to describe here. But um, um, uh, one of them is that, that thermodynamics started with steam engines. And steam engines uh, and the beginnings of thermodynamics started with the principle that if you go from liquid water to steam, you have more entropy, more disorder. It's not true. We have experimental evidence published and in the book that demonstrates that the evaporating water is highly structured and ordered. 
So the, one of the fundamental principles of thermodynamics on which the whole thing is based is not necessarily correct. And so I question the, uh, the current understanding of thermodynamics. Be that as it may, we're actually, this is a transducer that where you get work and radiant energy coming out and you have radiant energy coming in. So it's not just a body that absorbs this kind of energy. So the treatment is, will be different in that case. Okay, please. Um, th thank you, you answered my question about the flow direction. But what about the three micron versus the 270 nanometer? One is apparently creating the charge separation and the other is doing what? Well, I, so the, the, the latest evidence we have, we're not 100% sure. We know, we know that uh, if you put, uh, if you take, just wa start with water and you add light to the water, if you add 270 nanometer light, you get essentially no expansion, extra 270 nanometer, no expansion of the EZ. If you put um, three micron light, you get big expansion. It's ex uh, 10 times expansion is easy. It just w w very modest amount of infrared and essentially, essentially no increase of temperature that we, we can measure. So, so that's one thing. So for growth of the EZ, it looks like the infrared is very important and it's probably the infrared hitting the bulk water, which maybe somehow dissociates the molecules and allows them to go to build easy. That part, we're not sure. The 270 nanometers is used inside. It abs it's absorbed by the easy, not by the bulk water that's beyond the easy. And it looks like once you have an exclusion zone established, this 270 nanometer continues to separate charge within that exclusion zone. That's the best evidence we have. So once it's established, then you actually need this UV light to perpetuate the separation of charge. There's some in the environment, and uh, we have some evidence now. In, in the case of these tubes, for example, we found that if you add infrared light, you don't get any faster flow. If you add UV light, I didn't say that, but uh, you get the five times faster flow. So, and because the flow has something to do with charge separation by a mechanism that I haven't had time to discuss, but it's published, um, I, I, that plus other evidence leads us to think that probably the 270 nanometer UV absorption separates charge, doesn't build exclusion zones. There are cold lasers on the market um, used by chiropractors to eliminate pain and they emit infrared. To illuminate or eliminate? Eliminate. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they emit infrared light. And I'm wondering what you think is, the, is having the effect on the body. Sure, I mean light. Infrared light, some people for different syndromes use uh, UV light and some use visible light. It's all over the spectrum, literally, so to speak, to, to cure our ills. Well, if you, if you think about our ills, see, I, I think it's actually very simple. I think whatever ill we have goes down to the cellular level. Something is wrong. If I have a muscle problem, something is wrong with my muscle cells, right? If I have a neurological problem, something is wrong with my nerve cells. If I have a cardiac problem, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to build the function uh, of, of the cell. Well, how do you build the function of the cell? And I, I think that relates to the water that's inside the cell. Every protein is surrounded by easy water. The, the pr function of the proteins is to do something, to bend, to, to undergo some transformation. That's what does the work of the cell. Without that water, it can't function. There's a lot of evidence for, for that. So you want to restore the water. You restore the easy water. And how do you restore the easy water? Light is the simplest way. So I think that's the reason why light at very many wavelengths is so effective in reversing whatever problems we have, whether it's a depression problem or, you know, light really does, does the trick, I think. I'm a medical doctor and I think this is great groundbreaking work that you've done and I Thank would you. predict that in 10 or 20 years time this exclusion zone which being British I'm going to call the EZ is going to become very much more fundamental to our understanding of, of Thank biology. You. Yeah. One question, um, I was wondering how you control between uh, the effect of infrared radiation and the, the thermal effect, although perhaps you've answered that in as much as you were saying that ultraviolet has the same, um, has other effects that are similar, but also I suppose one could uh, argue that um, according to quantum theory that the exchange of energy would always involve photons anyway, but is, is it specifically photons or is it, has 
heat and temperature have been looked at? I think that, you know, heat and temperature, another chapter in my book, uh, they're vague terms. Different people in different disciplines define them different ways. I think they're not useful terms when we deal with physics. Uh, infrared or radiant energy is useful. You can define it by the wavelength and the intensity. But the terms, uh, I give three or four examples in the book of when you try to use temperature and try to use heat, you come up with weird, weird uh, uh, results that don't make a lot of sense. So I tend to stay away from heat and temperature. Nevertheless, most of the effects that we've, we, we, we put in uh, light and we measure the temperature by standard means. And in none of the experiments do we ever use enough to raise the temperature by more than, say, one degree. So it's, a, it's very secondary, even if you accept those terms as meaningful. Uh, one parting philosophical question. So if water can provide a photovoltaic effect, why does life and why do, for example, the oceans seem to require algae or some sort of a, a plant-like form to do the PV? Why can't the to water do the PV? Just to, to do the photovoltaics? Oh, uh, why, why can't the water itself provide energy for animals, for example? Well, we, uh, we don't know that, that they don't. For example, at the bottom of the sea, there are more species I'm led to understand at the bottom of the sea than there are at the top. You can't, there's no oxygen there, there's no light there. So, you know, where are they getting their energy? It's possible um, that, that the thermal energy that's coming from, from the core of the earth is building easy at, at, I mean, nobody knows, building easy at the bottom. So, and it's salt water around each salt molecule should be easy. Actually, the evidence is that you have a lot of, clusters of salt models with a lot of EZ that's negative and positive outside. And so it might be that your conjecture is correct, that this is actually what, what is uh, supporting life at the bottom of the sea. This is, I mean, an idea that needs to be tested. Good comment, thanks. Yep. Uh, that's it for the questions. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, thank you.